Where were you living at the time? In Niantic, at my mother's home, at 187 Pennsylvania Avenue, Niantic, Connecticut. And what year was that? 1962. Can you tell me why you enlisted? Yeah, I, as I grew up, I was inspired by my, my uncle, who has since just passed away recently at 92. Uh, he was a uh, sergeant major in the Marine Corps. And he told me a lot about it. And uh, I didn't really like high school, but I was smart enough to knew that I had to graduate from high school, so I did. And uh, I took the summer off and went into the Marine Corps. Immediately after your senior year? Right. I took the summer months off and went in, and uh, I think it was the 31st of August. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Again, uh, inspired by my uncle. When you enlisted, did you immediately leave for your basic training, or did you have time in between? No, I had time in between. I joined, uh, they, I'm not quite sure what the program was called, but I, when I was a junior, I was able to actually sign papers that allowed me to accumulate time. And what that, I didn't really understand that at the time, but it didn't sound like it was gonna, I, I didn't have a total obligation I may have been able to say when I graduated from high school, you know, I thought about it and I, I want to go to do something else or I want to go on to college, but I didn't and it actually helped me with pay. So I got a little more pay by being on the payroll for almost a year and a half before I actually went. Where did you go for your basic training? Paris Island. Well, good Marines. Um, can you tell me what Paris Island was? Like. <laughs> I guess now I could say it was fine, but I didn't think so at the time. I'll tell you, it was a culture shock. It was a culture shock, and uh, now that I look back at it, uh, it was a good learning experience. And I would recommend a lot of people go to it, because it doesn't hurt you. It, it makes you think, you grow up, um, you get yourself in good shape, and you can take on the world, at least you think you can, but you really can't. But it's a darn good start. How life. long were you in Paris Island? 12 weeks. Some people would say it takes a Marine longer in basic training because we're not as smart as the rest of the services, but I don't think that's true. After your Paris Island training, where did you go? Um, I went up to uh, Camp Lejeune for advanced infantry training at Camp Geiger. And what did they train you there? The basic um, infantrymen's uh, survival skills. You know, squad tactics uh, up to platoon level, and we were there at Geiger for a month doing those type of skill training. Was it all in the field training, or was there any classroom training? Most of it that I remember was all in the field. Matter of fact, I got a, quite an education uh, one day that I learned something that I kept with me for the rest of my career in the service. Sleeping out at night with a sleeping bag. I took my boots off like a good uh, Marine, put them outside my sleeping bag, and when I woke up in the morning, we had six inches of snow. So my boots were filled with snow. The, the lesson learned there is when you take your boots off, you put them in the bottom of your sleeping bag so that they stay dry. So that was a good life lesson learned for me. I bet you never left your boots out again. I never did, never. Do you recall any of your instructors from either basic training or advanced infantry training? Uh, no, I do remember one of my uh, drill instructors, Sergeant Desordia. Um, you spell that? Uh, I can't. What was it? Phonetically, D-I-S-O-R-D-I-A. I think that would be close. I could certainly look it up in my platoon book because I've always kept that book. What can you tell me about Sergeant Disorder? Well, again, in retrospect, nice guy. At the time, I hated him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he did his job, but I got to admit, back then, they could swear at you. They could get your attention by grabbing you by the nose and leading you around, grabbing you by the ear, backhanding you, knocking you over, getting your attention, 
good motivator because that's where we really learned. We kind of like grew from being a kid, immature kid, to having some good common sense. And if you listened and you did what you were supposed to, that's the, what you really came out of the boot camp with. At least that's what I came out with. After your advanced infantry training, where did you go? I was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, 2nd Marine Division, Camp Lejeune, as in the, um, in the infantry. And how long were you going to stay there? I was there for two years. What were your duties while you were at Camp Lejeune? I was in the um, rifle platoon, doing the regular things that rifle platoons do. You know, they, they move by uh, in squads. You learn to work with your uh, squad leader. Your your uh, fire teams are broken down into four-man teams with a leader, and, and uh, you learn uh, to work with those. And you also, uh, as you moved up in rank, you moved up uh, to squad leader and to platoon sergeant. So in the but two I, years, did you move up? Yes, I did. I, I made corporal. When I was in the Marine Corps back in uh, prior to Vietnam, you could not make E5 sergeant in the Marine Corps unless you shipped over. At that point in time, I had no intentions of shipping over, so making E4 corporal was quite a feat because it took a lot to get to that. The Marine Corps back in those days prior to Vietnam was only authorized strength of, I think, about 72,000 for the world. So there was not a lot of advancement. And that's why you never, I don't know of anybody that made E5 until Vietnam came about. After your two years at Camp Lejeune, where did you go? I, uh, I actually came home and got married. Oh. And, um, Honeymoon was cut short because that was the, in 1964, Khrushchev was suddenly left power in uh, Russia. And uh, the Second Marine Division got on boats and we went to Europe for about five months. And you went with them? Yes, I went so with them. So you were home getting married when you got your orders that you were going to ship out? Yes, I was on my honeymoon and got called back. Memorable honeymoon. Oh, I was all right. <laughs> I can say that now. <laughs> and that was in 1964? That's right. And where did you ship out to? We left Moorhead City. Every Marine that's ever shipped out of uh, Lejeune for overseas by ship knows Moorhead City, uh, North Carolina. And we went to, we cruised around over by the, by the uh, Mediterranean, North Africa, uh, did uh, stops in like uh, the Canary Islands. Um, then we actually uh, did a full division landing, which was pretty neat, um, in uh, Rota, Spain. And we spent quite a bit of time uh, training, keeping up our skills uh, in, in Rota, Spain, out in the desert. We st stayed out every night, never saw any buildings. So the Marine Corps, most of my career was out in the field. So I felt very comfortable with that, not a problem. Now, were you just staying trained in the event that they would need you somewhere? Yeah, that's exactly what the Marine Corps does even today. Every day they train to meet their mission, whatever that is, when the time comes. And of course, not long after we came back from Europe, I was supposed to go to the uh, West Coast and uh, Camp uh, Pendleton. And uh, I stayed home for a month with my, my wife, and that was the only time we really had any time really together since we were married, and two years before that, because I, I knew her real well in high school. So, um, but before I got to go, I received orders that I was going to Vietnam. I didn't even know where Vietnam was, what, let alone what Vietnam was. So you never got to go to Camp Pendleton? I got to go to P Pendleton just for a stop, about um, a short period of time to, for equipment, gear, uh, down to San Diego on a cruise ship to Hawaii, and it wasn't a cruise to Hawaii, it was a troop ship to Hawaii. Stayed in Hawaii for a short period of time to uh, the Philippines, uh, Subic Bay, we were there for a short period of time. Um, did some training there, uh, over to Japan itself, Tokyo. 
Irakuni area, then on down to Okinawa. We did training there for a while, jungle training, and uh, into Da Nang. In 19, I landed in there in, in June of 1965. So you had no idea you were going to be sent to Vietnam? No. I didn't even know what Vietnam was. What was your immediate impression when you got your orders? Well, I knew we were going to combat, but I had no experience, nothing. It's, it's kind of hard to think about that, because um, I have thought about that in the past. And I can remember leaning on the rail on the ship, and we were coming down the coast, and I could see the coastline, and just didn't, I couldn't, ra couldn't rationalize anything different than if I was on a, on a, on a cruise boat seeing land for a while and not seeing land for a while because I did get the chance to sail across the entire Pacific. That was pretty good. Now, when you went to Vietnam, did you go as a single person or did your whole unit go together? No, uh, we went as, as fillers. They were gathering up. See, I think, but I don't know this at the level that I was at at the time, being down at, at a company level. I don't know what the big picture was. And, um, but I do remember this, that once we got in country, we were fillers. And uh, there might have been some cohesive organizations on the ship. The troop ship was pretty big. Uh, there may have been that uh, groups of people, but I ended up being a filler for sure because I went into the, I got assigned to the 2nd sec, uh, Battalion, 3rd Marines, 3rd Marine Division. That was the big group that was in at the time. And uh, so I went to uh, headquarters and headquarters company of 2nd Battalion. Now, when you landed at Da Nang, what was your first impression of being in the country? Well, that was the first time I saw bullets and things flying. That still wasn't secure. The, the airfield wasn't quite secure. We, uh, we helped clear that airfield. And uh, my fondest memories of that was that we were able to get across it after about a week. and. Um, we wiped out what, what is called dog patch today. Anybody that was in Nam, that was in, um, in the Da Nang area after 1965, I would say if they knew about Marble Mountain, they would know about Hill 1000, and they would know about dog patch. They'd know what I was talking about. Dog patch was refugees. They just had a place to go. It was like cardboard, different things to build shade. Uh, to get out of the sun and lived. And uh, I'd never forgotten that because when I came back through almost a year later, it was all different. It was all built up. PX was there, everything. It was nothing but jungle and stuff when I was there. So when you first landed at the main, did you stay at that base for a while? No. No, How we long moved. How were you there, like a day? Uh, I want to say maybe less than a week of, oh. of moving forward. We didn't just get in a convoy and move out. We had to fight our way. We, we had to take it. the very time you landed on Yeah, it was pretty, well, it was. Be pretty scary being brand new. It was very scary. Oh yeah. It was, um, it wasn't an all out fight that you would see or think. It was sniper stuff. Sniper though can kill you just as bad as anything else. So you had to keep your head down, you had to be alert. But we quickly moved out north up into the Oshawa Valley. And I actually spent my entire rest of my time in country uh, up in the Oshawa Valley area on, on different things, different missions and things like that. We uh, ended up fighting up in the uh, Mountain Yard uh, country, which if anybody that was there knows about the Mountain Yards, they know that they lived up in the mountains. To me, they looked like they were prehistoric people. Uh, the animals were long hair. And I, they explain, I was explained to that that was the result of living above the, uh, the clouds most of the time. A weird feeling, quite an experience. But um, again, you didn't know who you were fighting up there either. Now, once you fought your way out of Da Nang and headed north, um, was it all on foot? Yes, most of it was on foot. Matter of fact, the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines, I, I, I want to say we were probably, I don't know how many miles north we went, but the battalion set up in a valley, the entire battalion. If you do that, you're talking about tent city, 
You're talking about a lot of vehicles. You're talking about all the logistics that go with it. It was huge. So when you, so what company or, or group did they put you with? If you were a filler, where, where I went to headquarters and headquarters company, basically in mortars and, and the 106 recoilless rifle section. What were your duties? Uh, to, we, I had uh, three guns, or 106s, and I had a squad. I was a squad leader. Now, were you still a corporal? Yep. Uh, can you tell me something about the 106 recoilless rifle? That's a pretty interesting weapon. It's a, it's a, a groove bore weapon. It's about 9 to 10 feet, the barrel. It sits on what we call a mule. A mule is a four-wheel, four small, low-level vehicle that can be driven uh, and uh, it's maneuverable 360 degrees around on that mule. But the, the good thing about the weapon, it had a large shell that you fired, but the interesting part of it was, on top of the weapon was a 50 caliber spotting weapon. What you did is whether, rather than wasting the big round at 3,000 meters, you would fire a phosphorus 50 caliber round out of the 50 cal gun and you'd watch that through the scope because it leaves a, a streak through the air uh, as it's traveling. And uh, once it hits its target, then you can adjust your gun until the, and making sure that the big weapon is right on it. And then of course you push on the firing knob and that big round would go off. And it was quite devastating. Now you were responsible for the crew for this 106? Yeah, three guns we had. You had three 106s? Yeah. Now, and your whole squad had to take care of that? Yeah. Yep. Shortly after we got there, we got assigned out to different infantry companies. And uh, I went forward with my crew, and we stayed out on one hilltop with a one infantry company for about five months, never to return to the battalion headquarters. You know, the reason why? Anybody that was in the service all knows that some of the chicken stuff that they would do with you back in non-war time. Well, they would still try to do some of that in the combat area as well. And it was better to be out in the real combat zone where you checked your own weapon, you checked your own ammo and things because you knew that it might be your life. So nobody that was there to bother you. So the guys that I had, all of us stayed. We were lucky. Now, we didn't have to go out on a patrol a lot. The infantry and those guys did that for that five months. but. I did sit there, and I can say honestly, on the hill that I was at, we watched the locals prep the rice field, their rice paddies. We watched them plant the rice paddies. We watched the rice grow, and we watched them harvest it during that time frame that we were there. So that was, that's just some little highlight of uh, not being in combat, but that's some of the stuff that really went on when you were there. When I was there, combat wasn't like what me, most civilians think it is. It's not every day. You're not engaged every day, because I don't know who could ever survive something like that. Combat comes when you have big campaigns and the, the enemy's there, it's, the enemy's concentrated, and that's some of the big um, fights that we had. Like during the time I was there, a battle of Idrang Valley. Very famous battle that um, we took a lot of casualties, but we stopped the enemy. That, I believe, was south of Da Nang, Idrang Valley. But I'm not quite sure of that. But I do remember reading about it and hearing about it. So that took place at the time I was there. I was not involved in it. There was a unit that came, that was an army fight. But that's what we would consider one of the bigger battles and a lot of casualties. And there were many more of those up until 1972 before everybody left the, uh, the country. Joe, when your squad went to this, this mountain on the top of the hill for five months, how big of a unit would go there? Obviously, it's not as big as the, the headquarters are telling you. Would it be a small group? No, it's a company. How big is a company? A company back then would be about 170 people with their artillery, with, with our indirect fire weapons, uh, with the mortars. They usually had 60s that belonged to the company, and then they would have 81s, or they would have what they call a four-deuce mortar, which is a pretty good big round. But those guys are specialists, and those get attached. So the company commander, which would have been a captain, he'd have his three infantry platoons, and then he'd have these weapons assigned with him. 
and we pretty much, some of the guys got transferred back and forth. Some guys got wounded, some guys got hurt pretty bad. They were evacuated back. There, where we were, and I don't remember the name of the hill, uh, the number. Um, but that all was with a, a hill number? Yes, there was a number on our, on our map, that's right. But it controlled an area north of Da Nang. Now, so nothing was there before you arrived. When you arrived, you had to set up a whole camp and everything? Mm -hmm. We dug, yeah, it's just an interesting story. Um, we didn't have, early in, in Vietnam, we didn't have all the logistics like the material to build a bunker. We, we had the entrenching tools to drill, to dig our, our foxhole. Everybody did that. We had the sandbags to fill so we could sandbag. But we made it, because we knew we were gonna be there a while, we made what we called a command bunker. A command bunker is, I think we dug a hole, maybe 10 by 10. It took us a month to do it by entrenching tools and fill in the sandbags. But now we had a, foot, a big hole in the ground right in our, our trench lines, but we didn't, how are we gonna put a top on it? Because an indirect fire, you could get killed. So we're looking around and we noticed that when we went down to a water hole, there was a lot of South Vietnamese people, or we thought they were South Vietnamese people, with caribou and stuff, and they'd wash their their um, cattle and do their washing and stuff like that. So you get to know them after a while, some of them. And uh, one guy spoke a little English, but we also learned to speak a little bit of Vietnamese. We were able to communicate for five dollars, we could get a 20-foot tree trunk about 20 inches in diameter. We could get three of them. So. My guys worked that deal out, and I didn't. When they told me about it, I said, "Yeah, right, sure, you'll get that tomorrow." Within two weeks, I get a call to go down to the main gate, and the um, the first sergeant of the company says, "Hey, Corporal Perkins, there's someone here to see you." And I looked, and I saw three guys with three water buffaloes, and each of them had towing behind them a huge log. Well, they weren't going to let these guys inside of our perimeter, of course, because we never really knew who was who. But we had the equipment that uh, we picked up those three things. We, be we built our command bunker, and that's what we had for protection if we really got hit bad. So that was our command bunker. And they helped us build it for $5. Yeah? What would a typical day be like when, for that period of time when you were on that hill? Um, we actually, because the, the, gun, the 106 recoilless rifle had a good effective range of about 3,000 uh, 3, meters, uh, you really would have to shoot that 50 to make sure you were accurate. Other than that, you were guessing. So we would do drills every day, and of course you had to clean the weapons every day. Let me tell you, you, you couldn't sit on the ground where we were, or almost anywhere in Vietnam, for that matter, probably, where it was damp or wet without uh, blood suckers. You had two, two types. You had the baby blood sucker and you had the full grown. Every day you got up, you had to be inspected and you had to burn or use, uh, we used a mosquito repellent to get them off you. Every day, every day you had to check yourself. Every day you had to make sure you had clean socks. The, when we first went in country, not within 90 days, our regular leather boots rotted right off our feet. And because we weren't prepared for that jungle, uh, it took time before we got the, what we call the, the jungle boot, the traditional, the green jungle boot that came out. I think I had six or seven months in country. My first original uniforms that they gave us, fatigues, they rotted off us after a while too. You can only wash them so much, but most of the time we washed them was we jumped into a lake, a river, just soaked up, drenched, cleaned off, and they dried, because you were wet from the rain a little while after that anyway. So you were always taking care of your own hygiene, personal hygiene. You were always improving your defensive position, and you always made sure that your flares, your, your, um, your different types of ammo and, and equipment that you had, you were cleaning it every day. If you didn't, our weapons would turn red from the, uh, from the rain or from the uh, condensation.
It was a never and never ending job to keep that stuff ready. Nobody that I know of did not clean his weapon. Even if he was derelict in civilian time, or I'm, I'm not civilian in uh, barracks time, not out there. I didn't see it. They were good at that because they knew that any given time, we only got hit once where we were, but I think that had to do with a lot because that company had patrols out every night. It had uh, patrols out during the day and things like that. And some of my guys went with them sometimes. They volunteered to go to on get the, the experience patrol. on the patrols. We let them go, yeah. Did, did you ever go on patrol or was your job to stay there and take care of them? I went out once in a while, once in a while, just to get the experience, to know what was going on. And, and we actually looked at on the map when you found targets of opportunity, what you thought would be uh, junction spots where they would gather to look at you. You always suspected that they were looking at you all the time. So I went out and looked at those areas when they were out on patrol. We went out and we did that. We knew 360 degrees a lot of the area after five months as to what was going on. So. Now you said that your camp had hit one time. What was that? Like? That was just small, sporadic fire. It was indirect fire. Started out with small uh, rifle fire, then indirect to fire. I would think that they were looking from long distance through field glasses, trying to see if they could hit it the CP or something that was important. They didn't. Most of the stuff fell short, but it, it woke everybody up, got, the, got our attention. Were there any casualties in your unit during that five months? No, not during that five months. If anything, medical more than anything else. So that's why I'm saying a lot of guys, you're not in combat every day. Now after your five months on that hilltop, where did you go? Then uh, we all, that area we seemed to, uh, for whatever reason, changed back to the battalion area. And um, then we would start doing what we call long range patrols. Uh, Aircraft would take us out, helicopters, drop us off, and uh, again, north of where we were, the Oshawa Valley, you'd spend about a month out there working. Patrols, uh, that was scary, though. That was now, scary. Now, was that a company level or a no, squad? No, no, that was platoon, platoon and squad. So how, how large is a platoon? A platoon's about 32 people. Oh, so... No, it's about 48 people, plus if they had uh, field artillery observers and anything else that they had, medic, things like that. So you're looking at close to 50 in the platoon with the support people. So you were sent out either in platoon or squad size right. um, for yep. these long range patrols? Yeah. And, and is that what you did then for the rest of that year? No, oh yeah, for the rest of the year, yes. Now I'm coming up right on just before Christmas of uh, 1965. So right. tell me about some of those long-range patrols. They were interesting. You know, most of the time, again, it was out by um, uh, by squad, and we had a platoon uh, area. And you always had two other areas that you would go to if you had problems and somebody got hit. So you always had an area to go to in case you did get cut off by some means. But we really, if you didn't grow up, you grew up then because I'll tell you, when at night, you just carefully moved off the trail. You didn't just run off the trail. You didn't walk off the trail. You felt your way off the trail because if you thought it was a good area, so did the Viet Cong, and they put those bungee traps in. Or they'll put one of the Malaysian whips in, which is where they bend a tree around another tree, tie it. You trip a cord, that thing comes around and takes your legs off and you're with it. Or they have the spike type with the um, spikes, they sharpen, tree limbs, small ones, tie them together, same thing, only it get you like that. We saw a lot of that stuff. They used actually used bear traps, small traps, big bear traps. Yeah, we've seen all kinds of stuff out there. But let me tell you, one of the things, I wanna go back for a second, another thing that I learned, and I'm sure that it crossed everyone's mind that went to Vietnam, or I'm sure, it's the same thing for anybody that was in World War II, Korea, any war that they've ever been involved in. As a young kid, I can remember sitting on a little knoll by Da Nang, outside the airfield, it was my first night. We dug in, there was already some positions dug, 
and I'm sitting there and I've got my squad in front of me and I'm supposedly somewhere in the middle back about 20 yards and I'm sitting there and it's a beautiful day, night. The stars you can see forever because there's not much light. Beautiful moon. And I'm saying to myself, I'm going to be here for a year. If I live long enough, how am I going to stay awake every night? I got to sleep. But if I go to sleep, I might get my uh, throat cut. What am I going to do? I made a decision right then and there. And this is, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I said, you know what? I have to have my sleep. And if somebody's going to kill me, I won't know it anyway. So that's what I'm going to do. And from then on, it never bothered me. And I slept every time and every chance that I had without issue. Now let's go back. Now I've been in country. I'm out on patrol. It was so scary at night that during the day, we thought we controlled some areas, okay? Uh, at night, though, we knew we didn't, and they did. And that was kind of scary, especially when you're out in areas, yes, you're going to set up an ambush. Yes, it's going to be an L-shaped ambush, or it's going to be a V-shaped, whatever it might be, depending on the terrain. But when it came time to sleep, you were touching your buddy, either with your foot, your leg crossed, or an arm crossed, because we've had stories and have talked to other guys where the Viet Cong slept right in between them and killed people and kept right on moving. And in the morning, when you got up, the other guy didn't move because he was dead, because you slept about five or six feet apart. So we learned very quickly you don't do that. So that's another lesson that we learned out there. Did we lose anybody out there like that? No, we did not. We were lucky, very lucky. Huh? All right, so if you would go on one of these patrols, they would fly you out there yes. and drop you off? Yep, that's how we got to know about the, uh, the Huey. Uh, if you can ask anybody that was in Vietnam, if they, especially if they were uh, infantry and they were out on combat missions or on patrols, or, or doing combat related tasks, and they needed the support for water or food. They always knew, now we also knew that the enemy didn't have weapons, obviously. They, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm sorry, aircraft. They did have jets, but they stayed up north, and then once they met our guys, they didn't ever come south again. But um, you always knew the sound, and you always popped the flare when you knew they, they, they knew exactly where you were because you didn't know who was around you. So that was pretty scary too when they came in. So they became a burden to us, but we needed them for food and for water all the time. When they would fly you out on one of these patrols, what was the purpose of your patrol? Were you there to set up ambushes? Were you there for recon? Um, we would do, that's exactly what we were doing. We were looking, trying to make an impact on the area, trying to protect villages, See, villages were always, during my time there, villages were being uh, plundered and destroyed by the Viet Cong to, to uh, ruin or destroy the morale of the South Vietnamese. They didn't come and take us on head on. If we were a large group, they wouldn't take you on head on. Uh, so they would do it at night. They would do it when we weren't there. So we were trying to make an influence try to recruit meaning, um, try to give a little bit of a comfort factor to the people. What was the worst part of that? The kids, little kids that, that were victims and you saw them burned or, or hurt. Um, and we were very cognizant of that. And we tried to give those kids candy, food, anything that we had. So we're, it wasn't, uh, we were there after the fact a lot of times, what the Viet Cong did to the people. And I, um, I don't know, it's just a memory. That, that was the worst part of it for me, seeing the little kids. They were victims. So did, did you set up ambushes at times? Oh yeah, we set up the ambushes. We moved a little bit at night, not much. I'll tell you, I'll, this is a, probably a good point to tell you about my first firefight. First time I was actually uh, fired at that, that I thought that was coming at, at me or my guys or in the total area we were in um, on the patrol just before dark we were going out to set up an ambush only they were there already and um, 
two things happened. I was about third in line. And uh, one of the things I talked to you about is different kinds of snakes in, that are indigenous to Vietnam, South Vietnam. One of the most dangerous is what they call a viper. It's a green snake, light green, and it can grow anywhere from three feet to 12 feet. Of course, when I see them, they're 15 feet. <laughs> I can't stand them. I can't even stand snakes to this day, but they are known to live in trees and fly. Well, I'm saying, I didn't know snakes could fly. Well, we were going down this pathway and um, our lead guy puts his hand up, puts his hand by his eyes, which means the enemy, and everybody gets down. Now we started receiving indirect fire. You're supposed to, you're trained with the helmet to have your chin strap locked, okay? Well, number one, it hurts with the, with the it's heavy on your head anyway, and it chafes with the heat because the heat is terrible. And um, so most of us were like John Wayne, didn't have it buckled. And so we started receiving the incoming fire, direct fire and mortar fire. Not much mortar, but direct fire. I can remember, <laughs> I can laugh about it today, it wasn't funny then. Um, I started shooting in the direction. When I did, I can sit right here right now and still picture what happened. Is all I could see. I didn't see the enemy, but I just fired. I know I wasn't firing at the two guys in front of me because I was firing off to their left flank. And uh, all of a sudden, it was like 50, it could have been 5,000 snakes started jumping from tree to tree in front of me, distance away, 40 to 50 feet away. All of a sudden, because I was firing semi-automatic in the recoil, my helmet slams down because I fell at that time with the snakes and everything coming, and I cut the bridge of my nose. I still have a scar here. Well, after it was all said and done, the medic comes running up. Anybody injured? Of course, I, my hand goes up. He comes over, holy cow, a, a, a purple heart. And I said to him, oh, well, I don't think so. <laughs> he says, oh, yeah, no, you are really cut pretty good here. I said, yeah, but if you look at my helmet, I think I did it on the, on the bridge of the helmet when it hit me in the head when I fell over. <laughs> it, was kind of, it wasn't funny then, but it's funny today. So needless to say, I didn't get a, a purple heart for that. <laughs> but I learned a lesson. Keep my helmet uh, buttoned, buttoned up. Did but, you after that? Yes, I did. Except that if I knew that they were going to do bombing, and I knew that I was going to be uh, near artillery, because you can get that concussion that, that you don't see. It comes through the air, and it'll knock you flat on your, your rear end. And, uh, but I, I'll tell another story about that in a few minutes. Um, so that pretty much ended up doing that right up through um, November of 65. Uh, all of a sudden, we got orders that we were going to um, board, we are going back, to, flying out from uh, up where we were in the Oshawa Valley, we flew out to an aircraft carrier. Now, on your patrol missions, were they all in the Oshawa Valley? Yes. So that's where you were? I was in the i -Corps area all the time I was there. Okay. Even when I came back. Okay, so you flew where? So we flew out to a carrier out in the ocean. I want to say the Valley Forge. She was a um, a Korean War vintage aircraft carrier. So that made her pretty much at the end of her tour in Nam. I don't know how much longer she stayed there, but anyway, we went to the Philippines to do special training. What kind of training? Well, they had us more of of uh, jungle type training. Uh, really getting us in shape, and def really what would it, what is called a defense of a river line type of training, and what that includes is obviously you got to have a river, and you got to have a purpose for doing that, and how to set it up with your logistics and things like that, and uh, so we spent 
um, Christmas holidays in, in a training area at Subic Bay in the Philippines. So it was Christmas of 65 or 66? 65. Spent about a month training and then we came back. And again, I can't, I don't remember. I never did take the time to take a map after the war and look to see exactly where I was and follow it. I was young enough, I felt as though I was lucky enough and that's just part of my life and I'm moving on. And I got out of there safe and sound. So today, I don't really read a lot of books about it either. I, I love history, but I, I study Civil War, those type, not Vietnam, because I took part in it, I think, and I didn't like the outcome. I didn't think we were supported right. But anyway, um, my first major campaign, you could say, the big campaign, where you were at battalion and brigade so level. You don't know where you were, when you went back to Vietnam, where you right. were? Right, I know I was in the Asho Valley. So you were back in back the Back in the valley, okay. yeah. Not in the same area we were. But but it was a campaign, and I learned later when I read the citation, or, or the actual the citation, I read the uh, battle action report that's written up after every major battle. And uh, it turned out to be at a brigade size um, exercise. And what really happened there is we, uh, we had a defense of a river line. The comical part of that, if there's a comical part of any battle or any fight, uh, is I think we all look at that in some ways to keep your sense and, and not get caught up in this thing and let it affect you. At least that's the way I did it. And I don't have that I think any problems with thinking and adjusting after all these years. Like I do know a lot of guys get that post-traumatic stress disorder and things like that. I know that's real. I didn't get that. And maybe it's because I had a sense of humor that I looked at things kind of funny sometimes. As an example, we dug in in a, it, right at dusk up against the big river and the enemy was on the other side and uh, we expected to be a hit at, at daylight the next morning. Well, you knew you were going to be? We, we expected it. We didn't know. You never know because if you did then you would do something different to try to stop it. But uh, digging away, digging away, got all dug in. At least one guy in the foxhole is on alert and the other two guys can be sleeping. Problem with that was, we were at a level where the, where the water level was high, and the first guy that jumped in the foxhole jumped into, into the foxhole right up to his knees in water. <laughs> so the entire line was underwater, like, yeah. But because you had to have a-, a So were a, you underwater in your fox line, in your foxhole? Not me, I didn't jump into it, somebody else did. I wasn't gonna jump in after that, but. Because you keep alert, you have to always have somebody on alert. You might be one quarter, 50% at, at just before uh, uh, dawn in the morning, just before first light, 100%. Uh, that's the way you usually do it, meaning everybody's up, ready to go. No movement, but ready to go. And uh, that's the way we were. And then all crap broke loose, uh, firing and everything else indirect. Our guys, the artillery opened up. Our mission, we ended up, for whatever reason, because I, again, being a corporal, didn't know the overall picture. You only know what you're supposed to know or need to know. We got on our aircraft and moved out, and um, we were supposed to, I learned later, our job was to be a blocking force and trying to block, it was two companies worth of, uh, group of us that went out. We were supposed to block them retreating back because we hit them with a lot of artillery and indirect fire and air. And uh, so we did that to some degree, and that lasted four days. But so the good- It was a four day battle? Four day battle, yeah, not, not firing. I was never in anything that, that was ever constant. Actually, it was such a distance, I think, that the air and indirect did a lot of damage. And- um, Now, what was the major campaign? This was? I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, let me think for a second. Jeez, I've known it all these years. Double Eagle. Double Eagle. Um, so two things interesting happened. So I came back, we flew back, and uh, I met the new lieutenant for the first time. Nice guy. We lost two in the platoon uh, back on the line that 
that I'd known. Um, but two interesting things happened in that battle. One, we learned, and I lost a very good friend. He's on the wall, Larry Keener. Keener? Keener, K-E-A-N-E-R. We found out Larry actually died of non-combat wounds. He actually contracted malaria, and before they could get him back and control it, he died. We found out later that that was one of the most infected areas in the I, in the I-Corps area for malaria. We didn't know it, but later on we found out that it was, and I don't know how many other people we lost, but I know I lost a good friend. The other thing that was good for me on January 8th is not only Elvis Presley's birthday, but it's my son's. Yep. He was born in right in the middle of that battle. So I didn't know that for about almost two weeks. You didn't know you had a son no. until he was two weeks old? No, nope. no. Nope. Uh, so he, uh, because of, it's, we were still in the, in the uh, area of like World War II. You know, the Red Cross is the one that, that notified you. And that's the only way my wife could uh, get a message to me other than writing me a letter, and she did. But I got a letter. I got a whole bunch of letters after that. And the first one I happened to open was my sister's, she told me. So it was pretty good. Uh, but to this day, I think my wife is still upset about the um, Red Cross not notifying me. But I don't think it was their fault. It was just a fluke. But to this day, I think if you asked her, she wouldn't be happy. <laughs> but so that was good. Uh, after that, we did the, uh, the next campaign for us was, and it was a good learning experience. As I had mentioned, the mountain yards went up into the uh, mountains and they were like prehistoric people. And uh, after that, it was pretty much patrolling. Well, how long time. did you stay up in the mountains with the mountain yards? We were up in that campaign coming up and down. You don't stay up there too long. We how had long aircraft. Did you stay, like days, I, maybe? days. It was days, two or three days at a time. And um, they flew you up? Flew us up and back every time, yeah. Again, I wished I had known some of the overall big picture that, that I could talk about, but I, again, I'm down at the squad level. And uh, so, so I What were your duties as a squad when they fly you up for those days? Same thing, we, we were rifle infantry. If, I don't think there's, I think the old saying is, everybody's an 0311, military occupational specialist. 0311 is a rifleman. Every Marine, no matter what he is, he's a, an 0311 also. So when they were flying you in, either up at the Mountain Yards or, or at the other places, you didn't always have that 106 gun. Oh, no. No, no. So when you weren't manning the 106, we you were, were a infantry. regular rifleman. Rifleman, yep. And what would you use for a weapon then? We had M14s. We did not transition. For whatever reason, we did not transition into the AR-15 until way in the end of my tour. So did you always have the M14? Yeah, most of the time I did, yep. What can you tell me about the M14? <laughs> when I was, I'll regress back to, the, uh, to uh, Paris Island. When I went in the Marine Corps, I was soaking wet, 140 pounds, okay? Five foot eight. The weapon is nine pounds, eight ounces. I, when was holding it out and pointing it, would strain to hold it up and out. Now, the M14 has a lever on it that you can take and pull the lever back and it'll either eject around or you can pull it back with the magazine in, and if the magazine is empty, it'll stay back. And usually that's how you know you run out of 20 rounds. So you take the magazine out and put another one in, pull it back a little bit and let it go forward. And it'll rack around in. That's how that works, basically. But for inspections, no magazine is in it, so the lever is always forward and closed. And for inspections, what you'd have to do is take your hand, the right outside part of your hand and take and put it over the top of the weapon and pull back and and then take your finger and lock the locking device to keep it open 
and that's for inspections. And you do that standing rigid and straight. Well, I couldn't do that. I would, I'd be stretching and try to do it. To make a long story short, by the time I got out of Paris Island, I could do it as well as anybody else, okay? But the, what I want to tell you is, as a young kid, didn't do a lot of shooting, I shot expert. I shot expert, and I didn't do fire watch or anything after that at boot camp. So how do I like the M14? It was excellent for shooting long range. It was very accurate. It was not good in Vietnam because of all of the moving parts that it had, and when sand got in it, it was terrible. I'm not sure that the AR-15 when it first came out was any better when it came to sand. But the AR-15 was a good weapon. The difference is the M14 was nine pounds, eight ounces, if I remember correctly. The AR-15 was six something. So the weight was a lot better. So, but it's still a great weapon. And if you look close at, at the uh, color guard, if you look close at the, the silent drill team, Marine Corps today, they use the chromed M14 rifle. And I believe at Arlington, maybe they don't. They might use the Grand. The Army always had the Grand. I don't know. I want to say they might have it, but I'm not. I can't swear to it for Arlington today. The Old Guard. How long did you fly missions up into the mountain yard? I would say not more than a month. It was a big operation. Again, we took part in it, but what, what was the overall? You could ask General Kurlak, maybe he could tell you. Was there a name for that campaign? If it was, I don't remember it. But that was probably why I got my other star, my combat uh, stars on my uh, ribbon. And how many stars did you receive? I got two. So Double Eagle was one, and I'm sure that's what the second one was for. You know, again, I hate to say it, but when my time was up in, in Nam now, um, oh, by the way, I did get to a point before the end of this for me, uh, I would sit down at night. It was so hot, we had walked so much, we were so tired that I can remember one day saying, one night, saying, fighting the mosquitoes, fighting the, the, the bloodsuckers, the leeches, uh, the Korean War vintage food in cans, that I can remember a few times saying, you know, I don't give a crap if somebody shoots me or I get hit with a bomb or whatever. I could care less. Now I know in retrospect, that was crazy because I had a brand new uh, baby at home, but I wasn't thinking that way at that time. So it really got you down. Not so much the enemy, but the elements and being there for so long in the heat. You know, here's another thing. It get down to 70 degrees at night, you had to put a field jacket on. It was like being in the desert, where it gets real cold at night. So you got heat in the day and cold at night. And the only thing you really had to keep warm in is your poncho liner. If you didn't have a poncho liner, you didn't have anything. Well, this is a good chance for me now. I'm gonna ask you some questions about daily life and, and that kind of thing. When you were over there, it sounds like you were in the field a good deal of the time. How did you stay in touch with your family? Letters, we wrote letters. Were you a good letter writer? Probably not. Was the mail service good? I wouldn't, I don't, wouldn't know what to compare it with. Because the only thing I can say is I wrote a letter, sooner or later she got it, she would write me, and sometimes, because I had my, my sister would write to me, my wife, of course, wrote every day, and my mother would write to me. And I'd get, sometimes I wouldn't get mail for two weeks, uh, and when I did, I got five, six, ten letters, you cherished them. Did you save any of those letters? Where could you save them? You put them in your rucksack. One, I hate to say this, they took up room, they got wet, you couldn't read them after a while. Sure, we kept them, I kept them for a few days, yeah, because I'd read them five or six times. Yeah. What was the food like? You know, I say I complained about it. Actually, the M, we didn't have MR, I'm, I'm speaking it too far ahead now, but the C rations were end of Korean War vintage. Uh, they weren't bad. They really weren't. I loved the crackers, the peanut butter and the jelly. Uh, I loved the, the frankfurters and beans. 
uh, the stew beef. I hated, we called them green eggs and ham. I hated the eggs, they were terrible. So most of it was good, some of it wasn't. I never smoked, so uh, I, I was always popular. We always, in the, in the pack, you always got a, a pack of cigarettes with three cigarettes in it. And of course, any, everybody that smoked loved them, so I was a, but I, I got smart after a while, I tried to trade for candy. See, because they always had a piece of candy in there too. So it became, after a while, I said, oh, wait a minute. You want the cigarettes? I want your candy. So I'd get the candy from them. So the whole time you were in the field, you ate sea rations? Two yeah. Two a day? Oh, yeah. Yep. I don't, I don't really know exactly how long it was before I ever stepped foot into a hard building. I probably did sometime in between. I don't remember it, but I do remember the first time that I can remember is when I got on a truck and I rode for half a day because I was leaving Vietnam. And I went into a building to be processed. Oh. That's the first time I remember. But I can't be sure of that. Maybe somewhere, somehow, I was in a building somewhere, but I just don't remember it. So my memories are I lived out under the stars every night. No tent. Oh, no. In the battalion headquarters, we had tents. But With I... All those long range patrols no. and stuff, you just... Poncho liner. Roll up in your poncho liner with your weapon hugged up against you. On the bare ground. On a bare ground. Yep. No problem. Wet all the time. Water tastes terrible in those metal canteens when you had to take the malaria pills with it when you had to take the quinine with it. You didn't dare uh, drink that running water because of what was in it. Did you always have enough supplies, enough food, enough clothing, enough ammunition, that kind of stuff? We always had, uh, yes, yeah, the answer is yes. And what we were smart enough to do in the long range patrol packs, they were always experimenting because we didn't have that stuff. They didn't plan on Vietnam that I know of. Uh, but so our military contractors were coming up with different and better food all the time f for the guys in the field. And they had what they call LERPs, long range uh, patrol packs. And they would actually put in number 10 cans of um, dried fruits. So when you opened it up, if you had a plastic bag, you could just put your hand in and get peaches, pears, plums, things like that. You know, they're dried, but very good. and. You didn't get that little packet of about seven or eight uh, jelly beans. You got a whole big bag. When did they start with that? That was that was after uh, that was sometime I want to say after the first of the year '66. Yeah, when we started. No, they could have had them before that. We just didn't have them. You know. Did you feel pressure or stress? What kind? When you're out in the. Well, yeah, you know, I just talked about that. And, and how did you cope with it? And you said that you think maybe one reason was, was your humor. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we made light of things a lot. The, the lowest point I ever had, and it wasn't that long, is when, I, like I said, I was tired. I'd had enough. I just had enough. I mean, you talk about the heat, the cold, the wetness. Uh, a brand new baby, a wife, that kind of stuff, it gets to you after a while. And then the artillery coming in with you. They're protecting us, but it's there, that kind of stuff. It gets to you after a while. But I, I, like I said, a couple of times I said it to friends, but that was after a long march. You get tired, and you're just sitting there, and you still got to go. And you say, I've had enough of this. You know, I don't give a crap if they shoot me or not. I know that's just saying something, but uh, you don't hope it happens. Did you do anything special for good luck? You know, no. No, like I said, my attitude was, well, you think about it for a second. Did I do anything for good luck? I sat on that hill, and if I said to myself, I can't stay awake for a year, I put it in my mind, 
and that was it. And I went to sleep every night because I knew I needed my sleep. to. If I was going to be sharp, if I was going to take kids in the battle when I was a kid, I took care of that. I had to make sure I was okay. What did you do for entertainment? What, in the field? Mm -hmm. Cleaned our weapons. Cleaned our gear. I'm telling you, that was an ongoing, everyday thing. Yeah, did I get back? No, I never got back to Da Nang. When I left Da Nang, I went north into the valley, and I would never came back. The only time I came back is when I came back through. See, I remember Dog Patch, but Dog Patch, as I told you, was nothing but a cardboard village. When I came back, there was a beautiful PX. Everything in the world was in it, and I hadn't seen that for a year. Did you have a chance to go on any R&R? &R? Yes, I did. Where did you go? I went to uh, Tokyo, Japan. For how long? For a week. What was that like? It was great. It really was. I got to see the country, and um, I went with two other guys. <laughs> we met a pilot from the uh, Canadian Air Force. He became a good friend. So we all piled around together for a week. We, you know, it's funny. When, once you got in country at Irukuni, um, we had to pay a dollar. That got us a pair of shoes, a shirt, and a pair of pants. For whatever reason, I guess I, I do realize, we couldn't wear a uniform in, in country. They didn't want you because they felt as though we'd be targets. Don't forget, Vietnam wasn't popular, so you didn't know what radical group might try to take out a soldier. So you mean when you were in Tokyo? When I was in Tokyo, we had to wear civilian. So we, the USO had uh, used, we all turned them in at, at the end of the week. I'm sure they washed them, put them back out, and you went out, and the next group picked them up. That was uh, no big deal, but yeah. So I, caught, I thought that was kind of funny. But we got to see the Ginza, the, the nightlife. Um, we were, I believe all of us were married, but boy, we burned the, we burned the old candle. Didn't get into late in the morning, but, because you knew within another few days, we we're gonna be right back what we were doing. So you enjoyed ourselves. I don't drink because I choose not to drink. Not that, not that I wasn't ever an alcohol, I never drank. That and smoking, I never did. So I pretty much knew what was going on around me. Some of those guys didn't. <laughs> did you see any USO shows? No, none. I heard about them. I heard about them. I heard about all of the young women that I missed. Yeah, they were there. But you know, again, in all fairness, I was in Vietnam at the, what I consider the beginning. When, when I say beginning, when we put first put big troop concentrations in, like the 3rd Marine Division. Before that, it was special forces, small teams, leaders, and stuff like that. Kennedy had put them in country, I think since 61, I'm not sure about that. But 65, in about the March time frame, is when the 3rd Marine Division went ashore. And right after that, I got assigned to the 3rd Marine Division and as a filler. And then the next group in was the seventh Marines. I'm sorry, the ninth Marines. And uh, we split 50-50 with them. Meaning 50% of our guys, because we had a little time in country, shifted with 50% of them. They went to the uh, Delta, way down south. So they, I didn't see them again, didn't see those guys. Do you recall any particularly funny or unusual events? You could say not funny. I didn't find it. My own humor, I saw some things that were funny that we did. And, and I rationalized as funny for my own sense. Uh, but unusual, yeah. I served uh, my first two years in, in, at Camp Lejeune. I was with a kid by the name of Wayne Heitch, H-Y-C-H-E, from Jasper, Alabama. And if he ever sees this someday, he'll laugh and remember this. Wayne, I didn't know exactly where Wayne went, but we were supposed to be going to Hawaii. Uh, but Wayne ended up, I found out later, went to the air group in Irukuni, Japan. And he turned out his job was a driver for the general. So, now I didn't think much more of that. As I got off the truck 
at Da Nang. I'm walking across the tarmac to the reception area. And I turned around because somebody from behind me yelled to me. And it was one of the guys that was on the aircraft with me. Uh, and I walked right into a guy. But he grabbed me. He did it purposely. It was Wayne. Hadn't seen him in a year, over about 15 months. Yep. And it was Wayne. So I got to see him because he was a very good friend. And then the other unusual thing was we get back to the States. We all flew home together because now I'd been promoted in the field and Wayne had gotten promoted to sergeant. And um, we were all on single orders. If you were a sergeant and above, you didn't go on a troop ship. And most of the time, it wasn't troop ship anyway going home because you went home as individuals. You didn't go as units back then. And uh, we flew into, the, into L.A. and you had to have your orders validated. So we did that, but, and we were all happy as could be because we all had around 30 to 40 days left on our original enlistment, and we were going home. They were, they'd let you out. Well, to our surprise, we all got extended 120 days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Figuring I'm going home to my family. I'm out of the service. All of us. Now, Wayne had been married, too, and I think he had a child at the time. Uh, but I think he had seen his child uh, before he went to Vietnam. I mean, to uh, Japan. But in any case, I remember him asking, where is the closest place that uh, the Marine Corps is for you, Perkins? And across the New Orleans submarine base right here in Connecticut. They had a Marine detachment there. And uh, I told him that. And he said, no, no, no. I mean the big base. So I said to him, well, what other base do we have on the East Coast except Camp Lejeune? He says, that's right. That's where you're going. So, fine. I got 30. He says, you can have 30 days leave. I said, well, I'll take it. We flew home. Spent 30 days with my family, first time I met my son. But then I had to take the next, the whole summer now, because I got home on June 14th of 1966. I stayed home for a month, and then I went uh, to Lejeune. And a funny thing there, they didn't really get along with us. Rationalizing it later on, years. The reason they didn't is we were the first groups coming back from Vietnam. We were young guys with three or four ribbons, and they didn't have anything, and they hadn't been in combat. So I think it got to a point of where, and I went to the, I can't remember whether, I think it was the 11th Marines, or the 8th, I'm not sure. I got assigned to there, and Wayne was there. All of the guys that I served with back then were there. They all got extended, and we were all back there now. So it was like a reunion for us. And um, I ended up talking my way out a week early. So I got out October 15th instead of the 21st of 66. October 15th? Yeah. 60. Now, when did you get promotion? I think it was March, March of 66. Is when you were promoted, and where were you? you were I was in Nam. Where? And in, in just with the platoon that I was with, with the group of guys that I was with. And what were you promoted to? Sergeant E5. Um, when you when your tour was up in Vietnam, where did you leave Vietnam from? Because you left in Da Nang. So you went back to Da Nang. Oh yeah. The change and All built up. I couldn't believe it. And did you stay in Da Nang long? Or did one night. One night, got on a plane the next morning, flew to Guam. From Guam to Hawaii, the aircraft got grounded. We, were gonna, I, we asked, how long is it going to stay in, in uh, Hawaii t uh, to uh, be upgraded? They do so much work on the engines after so many hours. And they said they didn't know. Well, we were all interested in getting home. So one of the, somebody told us, they said, TWA was flying then. And they said, you know, you might want to go over to, uh, to the airfield and they have what they call a red eye flight that they take maintenance people and, and flight attendants, they call them stewardesses back then, back to the States. Uh, yeah, right, we got a good chance of that. None of us had any money. So we did go over and we asked 
and we, we, we have no money, but we want to get home. We all flew home free. They took you on TWA? They took us on TWA and flew us back for free. Yep. Yep. We had just enough money because we knew they were taking us into uh, LAX, and uh, we knew we had enough money to get from there back to our home state. But uh, we didn't have enough from Hawaii to there, but they gave us a free flight home. I don't know how long we would have ended up staying. Hey, any other time, we'd have loved to stay in Hawaii, but we wanted to get home. So when you landed in L.A., did you immediately go home? Yeah, right after they gave us the bad news. Oh, so you did find out right there. Oh, yeah. Were oh, yeah, because we would have been discharged. I, I was under the belief that we would have been processed out of the service Probably would have stayed at Pendleton for a week, did our physicals, did all of the proper paperwork, and then shipped home. So we would have been on the West Coast for the most a week, probably. That was our own thought pattern. What, is that true? I don't know that if that's the way it would have went, but we thought that's what would have happened. But the guy said, if you got you all have 30 days, you got more than 30 days, you can take your 30 days, go home, and then report to Lejeune. And we all did that. When you reported to Camp Lejeune, what were your duties there? Nothing. They didn't. Re we were extended. Why we were extended, who knows? But they didn't expect us. And um, I'm pretty sure it was the 8th Marines that I was assigned to because right at the end of the time, about the September time frame, the 8th Marines were always doing the med crews. See, the 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines that I was in, we, my first tour of duty in the division, I actually went to Guantanamo Bay for six months and stood the guard duty on Leeward side. So I got that experience there. The following year, they rotate a, a company, not the same company goes. So we did the Roosevelt Roads training uh, in Puerto Rico for that six month cruise in the summer. So the, 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 the Marine detachments are always out at sea most of the time, and the 8th Marines had the Mediterranean. So they wanted me to ship over, me and a whole bunch of guys, to stay and take the uh, six-month Mediterranean tour, and then they would have let us get out. But again, we, none of us were going to ship over. If we shipped over, if we stayed, we would have went back to Vietnam. Nobody in his right mind is going to take the chance. Some guys did, though. Some guys did, but I didn't. I felt as though I got out of there safe and sound. I'm not taking my chances. Not with a little guy at home and a wife. And I made the right decision, I think. What did you think of the officers and your fellow Marines in Vietnam? Uh, I, most of my time was spent with the enlisted, obviously. I liked them. Now, I know that I had heard and I read sometimes that if you were in Vietnam, you were either on drugs or booze or something. I can unequivocally tell you, I never came across drugs in our unit. And I'll, I'll get, then again, I'll say it's probably because we were the first groups there. It wasn't settled in. I'm not saying for one minute that they didn't have a lot of that uh, later on, but not when we were there. I had no contact with it. Booze, I understand back in Da Nang, in the built up battalion areas, whenever they could get you two cans of beer or two cans of soda a day, you got, that's what was your ration. Did somebody get three or four and get drunk? Probably, I never saw it. Because all the time we were forward, we never got any of that. Never got it. Did you stay in touch with any of your buddies from Vietnam? Yes, I did. Not, um, not too much. Uh, and I actually lost Wayne Heitch's telephone number. Because I was in the Connecticut State Police, I was able to, through, I knew a friend that I actually, because I was in the State Police, but when I was, after I had retired, and was with Sikorsky Aircraft. We had a, a place in Troy, Alabama, and I, I had a good friend there that worked there. I asked him to contact the Alabama State Police in the Jasper area, which is northwest of uh, Birmingham, if they could look up a Wayne Heitch. I only know 
his proximate age and that he lives in Jasper. If they would do me a favor, a fellow troopers a favor. Sure enough, within a week I had his number. So I called him and talked to him. Are you still in touch? I talk to him every once in a while. Do you attend any reunions? Uh, you know, I to this day get Leatherneck. I read it every month. I always like to read the sound off response back and I always check to see when the reunions are. I could belong to the uh, to the um, second Marine Division group and I could belong to the third Marine Division group. I choose not to. Uh, if you go to that, what is the chances that you're going to run into a guy that you would know? Maybe one in a thousand? I don't know. But I don't. I just don't. And, but I always look to see if the 2nd Battalion 3rd Marines or the 2nd Battalion 2nd Marines are having one. I would go to that because that's a battalion. And chances are I'm going to know somebody in that group. What did you do in the days and weeks immediately after your discharge? <laughs> you come home, you got a wife and a brand new baby. And I got to see him, he was just under six months old. But I went out about two days later, because I could not stand, all of a sudden I'm standing there, and I've got a wife and a baby, and I don't have a job. The one thing we both did is, she stayed at home, she lived at home, she saved her money. I took five, what was the equivalent of five dollars a pay period, and um, I had no place to spend it. And. Uh, I, don't, I think I spent it on candy or something whenever I got a chance to get something. But uh, I saved all my money. So we had that and my wife's savings uh, to live on. We found a brand new apartment and we set up house. The second day out, my wife will probably kill me for telling you this, but I went out and the first day I got an offer. $78 a week to work for Southern New England Telephone. <laughs> I come home, I'm proud and I'm happy I got a job. She says to me, <laughs> are you kidding me? How are we going to live on $78 a, a week? I said, I don't know, but it's better than nothing. She showed me a flyer that she had seen at the library for being a trooper. They were advertising for recruits. So I, uh, I called the number. And they told me that I had missed the time to sign up. I'd have to wait another year. I said to them, I'm just out of the Marine Corps. I'm just back from Vietnam. Oh, you can come to take the test. So I went and took the test. Had no clue what it was about, but I went and took the test. And about three months later, the state of Connecticut is slow on doing test results, apparently. and. Um, my, I was working, and um, I, what I did is I ended up taking a job at Pfizer. But I told the guy, because I got more money, Charles Pfizer over in Groton, I got more money, but I told the gentleman that hired me, I took the test for the state police and I want to be a state trooper. And he said, that's fine, don't worry about it. You work, continue to work until you get selected. So I did that. About three months later, my wife calls me. She said, hey, you got a letter from state personnel. It's got to be the results of your test. I failed. I failed the test. So it said, they said, I'm sorry, but you failed the test. You can take the test in a year from now. And I had known from guys that I had talked to that the average guy takes the test two to three, and I knew one guy that took it five times before he got selected. He passed it. So I said, okay, it's the way it goes. So I had a job, so I was okay with it. A Couple months later, a letter from state personnel. My wife says, hey, you got a letter from the state of Connecticut, state personnel. So I said, well, why don't you open it and see what it says. Sorry for the inconvenience, computer error, redoing your uh, exam. You actually uh, uh, passed your exam in the 92 percentile, and you're scheduled, if you should accept, uh, to continue 
for a physical on such and such a date. So I went through the process, and it took a year. By the time you do everything with the state police, because they really go through you, uh, it takes about a year. And then I went to the academy for, for 18 months. So and when became did a you start working for the state police? Nin uh, November 1968. And how long did you stay with them? Just about 22 years. August, uh, September 1st, 1990. Joe, what was your homecoming like when you came back from Vietnam? You know, I've had that question asked to me a lot. Um, I've thought about it. I was actually the first kid from East Lyme, my hometown, that went to Vietnam and came back. And I was welcomed with open arms. Small town. Uh, I was the first one that, they, that joined the American Legion. And I got a nice write-up on that. I was treated pretty good. I couldn't associate, and I, I really believe that this, uh, you gotta remember, at that time, the country was probably against Vietnam to a degree, but nothing like it was in 67, 68, 70. I mean, it got worse as time went on. People were going to Canada, people were jumping off of buildings or whatever they were doing, and you saw the demonstrations and, and, and the real hippie time, uh, which was a good time, uh, but really took effect then. So I gotta tell you, I, I didn't get affected by it. Did I like it later on? Hey, I was a brand new trooper. I was on top of the world. I, I used a GI Bill a couple years later. By the way, if you ask me one of the things that I best learned from my four years, a little more than four years in the Marine Corps, was I had a great time, great experience, but I realized if I was going anywhere in civilian life, I needed to have that education. I did learn that. So what did you study on the GI Bill? Criminal justice. Why did I study criminal justice? Because I was a state trooper. What, why wouldn't I study that? And the University of New Haven at that time had one of the foremost programs in the country. I believe they're still considered one of the better schools uh, in the top 10 maybe. I know Michigan has really come a long way for that. And then my good friend, uh, who was a state trooper at the time, he went to school with me. He's nine years older than me. And he'd been a trooper for nine years. But he wanted to go to school, and he did. He paid for his. And I got mine free under the GI Bill. He says to me, Joe, let's go on and get our master's degree. I said, no way. I've had enough of this. I worked and went to school at the same time. Are you kidding me? He said, we'll never, we'll never forgive ourselves if we don't. I said, get out of here, Joel. You're crazy. I said, I'd have to come up with the money. That's expensive. He says, why don't you check with your counselor, your uh, military counselor, and see what he says. I saw him, and I asked him about it. And he said, let me check. I didn't know of anybody that was going to the advanced schools uh, on a GI Bill. He came back and told me, he says, what do you want to do? Well, I want to take public administration. It's a two-year course master's degree. He said, fine, you got it. So you got your master's? So I got my master's in public? public administration, paid for by the GI Bill. So do I have any beefs with the military? Absolutely not. Nope. I served my country, got a nice education, and it's paid off for me ever since. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yeah. What are you a member of? I'm a member of, today, the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Are you active in those groups? No. I pay my due. I'm a life member of the VFW. Uh, later on in life, of course, I can tell you as we go down the path of some other organizations that I, I belong to. Did your military experience in Vietnam affect your thinking about the military or war in general? Not really. Too young, too inexperienced, uh, short-lived. I could probably, if you ask me that question, 20 years down the road, when we get to it, I'll answer it differently. I'm going to break at this point in the end of part one.